Dear colleagues, uh, this is uh, Danny Booser, and uh, it's my big pleasure to talk to Professor Maurizio Araujo uh, uh, in the second Corona Implant talk. Nobody has to introduce Professor Araujo because he's a very, very famous scientist, a clinician, and speaker from uh, Rio de Janeiro in uh, Brazil. He has published, I can tell you, a paper that made a fundamental change the way implant dentistry is clinically used today because he published in 2005 a paper prof with Professor Jan Linde on rich alterations post extraction and this fundamentally changed the way of thinking from biological point of view. So Di Marizio, what a pleasure to have you on our Corona talk. Thank you, Danny. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so very much. And by the way, to those who doesn't know, the first talk, the first ever time I spoke about socket management was also because you invited me to talk in 2005 in the ITI International Symposium in Munich. That is absolutely right, six, yes. Eight years yeah. ago. <laughs> okay, now let's come to Greece huh? because you see this, uh, we made the same setup in the first talk with, uh, with uh, Stephen Chen. Uh, so we have a topic uh, that is related to socket grafting and its implication uh, in daily practice, the current knowledge and how to use it. And we divided up our, uh, our discussion, a dialogue. Huh? It's a sort of a lecture, of course, presented by you because you prepared a fabulous presentation. And we're gonna have three portions of discussion. So you start with a biological, by bio, the biological introduction. Uh, so everybody understands the aspects of tissue biology. And then we have a discussion and then you go on. So I think I give you the screen, you take the screen now and uh, uh, you can uh, start with your part number one. Okay, here we go. Fabulous. It works. It works perfectly. Yes, it does. Now, so dear colleagues, I'm going to uh, present you a uh, series of slides dealing with uh, socket management, in special how to preserve the dimension of the ridge following tooth extraction. And as uh, Professor Woods uh, already said, <clears throat> my presentation was divided into three parts. The first one, I will address biological concepts. The second, I will address how to do it. Even better, how I do it. <clears throat> and the third section, I will present different ways to do reach preservation, different indications for reach preservation. Now, I also like to say that I, I do, I am really from Rio, that's absolutely true, but my university is located in the middle of Brazil, in the countryside of Brazil. <clears throat> and I can forward here, and this is Maringá. This is, it is exactly in the middle of Brazil, in the north of a, of a state called Paraná. And I'd like to say that uh, I only able to present what I present because of the people who works with me in my uh, unit. And I thank them very much for all the help. Now, with that said, let me introduce you, let me introduce to you our main character. And this is the alveolar process that you can see on your screen. And the alveolar process is this bone that surrounds the root of a fully erupted tooth. And I have uh, drawn a green dotted line to divide it, the maxilla. So below is the alveolar process and above is the basal bone. Now, the alveolar process is very important as we all know 
to support the teeth, but also to support the soft tissues. So the ovular process, its volume also has an impact on the framework of teeth in all the statics that is provided by the gingiva or by the soft tissues. Now, let me describe a little bit more the alveolar process because that will be important in the very beginning of my presentation. So to your left, you can see a CBCT scan. Now, I will draw a green dotted line. Now, above, you see the base above. Below is the alveolar process. To your right, you can see the buccal or facial bone. And to your left, you can see the palatal bone, right, of the alveolar process. Now, I will present the same, but a histological section. Once again, you see my green dotted line above the basal bone, below the alveolar process. Now, I'd like to tell you at this moment that the alveolar process is made of two different types of bone. The first one is a bone that faces the root surface, mm, that is in direct contact with the periodontal ligament, while the remaining bone is something completely different. So let me tell you that the bone that faces the root surface, I will magnify this bone. This bone is called bundle bone. And it's called bundle bone because it is invested by bundle of collagen fibers coming from the periodontal ligament. Actually, these collagen fibers connect the cement to the bundle bone. And by the way, the bundle bone, periodontal ligament, and cement are just one single structure that ultimately connect the tooth to the skeleton of your patient. The bundle bone is formed and is maintained by the cells of the periodontal ligament. The cells of the periodontal, periodontal ligament produce bundle bone, periodontal ligament, and cement, and this is one single structure totally tooth dependent. So when I remove the tooth and I remove the periodontal ligament, or at least half of the periodontal ligament that's attached to the root surface, the remaining periodontal ligament, including the bundle bone, will disappear during healing. And I'm going to explain you in detail this. Now, <clears throat> I have defined to you what the alveolar process is, and I also have uh, described the components of the alveolar process. Now, let's take a look at the alveolar process without the tooth. When I look to the alveolar process, I look to the socket that's inside the alveolar process. This is a bone defect. And this is a very nice bone defect. It's a four wall bone defect. It has a meso, has a distal, has a buccal, has a palatal or lingual bone walls. So I have a, a perfect stability for my blood clot. The blood clot is protected by all these walls. Not only that, not only that, you can also appreciate it because of all these bone walls. I have a wonderful availability of bone cells and also blood supply. So this is a wonderful bone defect. And I can't stop thinking as a periodontist that when I have a periodontal defect that's only three walls, only three walls, not four, just one three walls, and then it is four millimeters deep or even six, I know that whatever regenerative therapy I do, I will be successful. Now I have this beautiful defect. It's four walls, not three, four. And it's not <clears throat> four to six deep. This is 10, 12 <clears throat> deep defect. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful defect. And on top of that, I have all this soft tissue. 
And this soft tissue that covers the alveolar process will provide cells that will close the socket entrance. So this is a perfect bone dish. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm gonna guess, uh, see, can you get me a glass of water, please? Just excuse me. <clears throat> now let's continue. Now I told you that uh, alveolar process, alveolar uh, socket is a four wall bone defect. Great. Now let's keep that in mind because now I want to tell you that not all <clears throat> four wall bone defects are the same. Not all. <clears throat> now, let me describe to you this particular four wall bone defect. And now I have a glass of water. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Now, let me describe this very special four wall bone defect. It's made by a very special wall a wall made by a bone that's very different from all the bones in the other, other areas of the body or in other areas of the skeleton. So let me describe to you this particular type of bone. Now, this is a histological section. This is a buccal palatal section of a human canine. And I will magnify the buccal wall of this human canine. You can see from your left to the right. First, you see the dentin. Then in a dark color, you see the cementin. Then you can see the periodontal ligament. And light pink, light pink is the very thin buccal wall. Well, I told you that this buccal wall is made of bundle bone and alveolar bone. However, when the buccal wall is a little bit too thin, until a certain dimension, the entire thickness of this buccal wall is made of bundle bone. That bone that I told you, that's nothing but mineralized periodontal ligament. Now, this is a human a canine. Right? And now if I uh, put a, a different color, this is polarized light. You can see that the entire thickness of the buccal wall is made of bundle bone. Maybe you don't know about histology. That's fine. I just want to make a point that in some situations, the entire buccal wall is made of bundle bone. Now, what is this thickness? Well, in humans, this thickness goes up to 0.4 millimeters, the thickness of the bundle bone, right? So up to 0.4 millimeters. Let's remember that particular number. Now, with that in mind, you know this number, let me tell you another number. What is the average thickness of the entire buccal wall, not the bundle bone, the entire buccal wall. And there are many papers describing this. Just because it's my presentation, I'm presenting you that particular paper that was published by uh, Alessandro Januario and myself. And by the way, it's the paper with the largest amount of individuals, the largest sample. 250 individuals. But if you take a look in other papers from different geographic regions, the average thickness of the bundle bone may change. In this, at least in this Brazilian population, with this very large population, it's about 0 0.6 millimeters. In other papers, it might be in average 0.7 or 0.8. Nevertheless, if I told you that, now let's go to the uh, following slide. Now I told you that the thickness of the bundle bone is let's say half millimeter, 0.4. Let's, let's round it up to half millimeter. Now with that in mind, let me show you 
this frequency distribution of my sample, these 250 individuals. I know that the, I take a look to this table to your left, that more than half, 54% of the K9s, one millimeter below the buccal crest, has a thickness between thickness between 0.1 and 0.5. What does it mean? It means that the entire thickness of this buccal wall is made of bundle bone. So the entire wall is made of bundle wall, bundle bone that is a, a bone very unstable because it's just periodontal ligament mineralized. It's not going to stay for long. Now, if you look at the lateral incisor, you see 40% of the buccal wall has a thickness of less than 0.5 millimeters. Again, the entire thickness of this particular buccal wall is made of only bundle bone. Now, let's move to the center incisor. Basically, 50% of the center incisors are made of only bundle bone one millimeter below the bone crest. And you can see in the, on the third line, the third line of this table to your left, only about 50% of these tooth sides, we have a buccal wall that's thicker than one millimeter. Now, if it's thicker than one millimeter, most of the buccal wall is not made of bundle bone. Now let's move to the table in the middle. Now it's three millimeters below the bone crest. You see a similar situation. Let's go to the table to your right. Now it's five millimeters, the buccal crest. Once again, only about 15% of the buccal walls will have a thickness larger than one millimeter. In other words, what does it mean to be larger than one millimeter? Most of the buccal wall is not made of the bundle bone. It's made of a vula bone that's much more stable. So this one millimeter, one millimeter is a magic number. Now, in conclusion, at the marginal portion of the vula process, only about 50% of the buccal walls will be thicker than one millimeter. Now, with that I told you, yes, the socket has a four wall, is a four wall bone defect. Oh, it's a lot of stability, a lot of bone cells, a lot of blood supply. However, the quality of such bone walls is such that it's not very stable. It's very different to have a four wall bone defect in the base of your mandible, or maybe in your femur, or in your calvaria. It's a completely different story. Now, let's go forward. That's something else. What about the location of this four wall bone defect? Now, take a look to the patient to your left. Now, it, it is a patient with a large, large basal bone. You can see that's the patient that the apex of this particular lateral incisor is far away from the outer surface of the buccal wall. You can see that the buccal wall is very thick. You know that this such a thickness is not the normal, not normal, it's not the most common in humans. And if I draw a line parallel to the long axis of the root, I can see that this line prolongs into the basal bone. What does it mean? It means that this particular alveolar socket is inside the our, uh, bone envelope. Now, now, let's go to the patient to your, our right. And then I have, Danny? Yes. I listen to you. I listen to you, no question. Now I have to ask my son who is in front of me to please stop because he's making jokes while I'm lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making That's... jokes of you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, to the right, you can see a very different situation. You can see a, a patient with a very narrow basal bone. 
the apex is at the buckle wall. The buckle wall is very thin, as you can see. And if I draw a line parallel to the long axis, I can see that this line is outside the basal bone. So this particular alveolar socket is at least partially outside the bone envelope. So now let's just imagine that I'm going to extract this both lateral incisors. You can imagine that at the right, the situation will be very different. This alveolar socket will be filled by blood clot that will be very well protected by these thick buckle walls. Okay, and also imagine that the availability of bone cells and blood supply will be much higher in the patient to your left. But what about the patient to my right? The moment I extract this tooth, just in case I don't have, let's suppose I don't, this buckle wall disappears during my tooth extraction. Or even maybe I don't have the buckle wall. I might have or not, I cannot see so well in this CBCT, uh, CBCT scan. Immediately, I will suffer the pressure of the soft tissues that will occupy the space previously occupied by the root. And by that, immediately, I will lose the space. Or oh, let's say another option. I do have a very thin, a paper thin uh, alveolar uh, buckle wall, but it, it disappears in two days, three days. The thinner, the quicker it disappears. And then immediately, the, my blood clot that has no resistance will be pushed by the soft tissue. And by that, I will lose all this volume previously occupied by the roots. Obviously, you can see just by looking at these anatomical features that the final outcome of this tooth extraction will be very, very, very different in these two different situations. Now we have to keep this in mind. Now let's continue. Now there's another anatomical uh, um, um, feature that I like to remember. We published this paper last year uh, in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. And this is a very fine description of the alveolar process and basal bone for those who are trying to increase their knowledge for the better diagnosis of the cases. So in this particular uh, study, we described this, the alveolar process in basal bone. There are several anatomical features that I described, but the one that I think is most important for today is this one. What is the average thickness of the alveolar process from the outer surface of the buccal wall or facial wall to the palatal wall. What is this, this, this thickness? Hmm? This is about nine millimeters in humans. From K9 to K9 in average, nine millimeters. So this is, this is actually uh, a dimension that if I am able to preserve, I can use to, to house an implant. I know I don't even need to preserve 100%, but this is give you an idea about dimension. And also there are anatomical difference between K9 lateral incisors and center incisors. But let's continue. Now, my dear friends, I had described uh, the stage in which our story that I'm telling today takes place, the alveolar process. But now I have to describe to you the, the healing, the wound healing that takes place in this particular anatomical uh, uh, location, the alveolar process. And the wound healing and the, at the alveolar process at the socket is called socket healing. And it can be divided in three parts, the inflammatory phase, the proliferative phase, and the remodeling and modeling phase. And I will describe to you very quickly, because you understand how the wound healing 
that takes place in the alveolar process, in the socket, will uh, make the whole story very challenging. Now, this is the inflammation that takes place immediately following tooth extraction. First, the socket filled with blood clot, and the blood clot is replaced by granulation tissue. The inflammatory response to the trauma. Very nice. Now, after this inflammation goes away, there is resolution of the inflammation, this granulation tissue will be replaced by new tissue. Now it's time to new tissue formation. And the first tissue to be formed is the organic matrix that's called provisional connected tissue. At least it's called by me connected tissue, uh, provisional connected tissue. And I'm highly influenced by a great researcher from Switzerland called Robert Schenk. And I, I think uh, he is the father of many input concepts on biological, bone biology. So this organic matrix will eventually mineralize in a new bone, in the first spongiosa, the first bone to be formed that's called woven bone. And woven bone is a very interesting bone, very interesting. It forms during wound healing because it has the capacity to be deposited in a high speed. It forms rapidly. And during wound healing, we are in hurry. We are in hurry. It's no time for lamella bone formation. However, I have to pay a price. We pay a price for all this hurry. And the price is that the world bone has no load bearing capacity. It needs protection. Remember this, woven bone needs protection. Well, in the third and last phase of wood healing, woven bone has to be removed by osteoclasts to open space for the formation of more mature bone types, the lamella bone and the bone marrow. And by that, the healing is finished. Great. But now it's missing to tell you one particular part of the socket healing process. What is happening at the outer surface of bone? What's happened there? Let me tell you a story. This is a buccolingo uh, section representing one month of healing. Sorry, two weeks of healing. Now you can see inside the socket, woven bone, and I have explained to you what woven bone is, mm -hmm. and some remaining blood clots and some remaining provisional connective tissue and, and granulation tissue. Very fine, no, no news, but what I want to tell you that is that is the osteoclast not only, not only comes into the socket to remove the woven bone, it also removes the surface of the bone, the old bone, removes the surface of the old bone, especially at the crest, bone crest. And now you can see to your left, the lingual crest and to your right, the buccal crest, and how this osteoclast is removing the surface, right? And this is called modeling. Here you can see in one month healing, you can see the woven bones completely uh, taking place the inside of the socket, right? And again, the crests, oh, sorry, the surface are covered by the osteoclasts. They continue to remove, to remove the surface. And because the buccal wall is very thin, because this buccal wall is very thin, only made by bundle bone. Remember, bundle bone is covering the root, very thin. This uh, osteoclast activity at the end will remove this buccal wall, will expose the woven bone. And woven bone has no load bearing capacity. And all this woven bone that was formed inside the socket will disappear. It will not stand. 
the contact with the soft tissues. And then we have this type of profile of the healed ridge. And you can see that is like a triangle in which the peak of the triangle is the lingual wall because the lingual wall is thicker, right? So it will stand. And the bound bone is don't a small fraction of the lingual wall, while the bound bone at the buccal wall in many situations is the entire thickness of the buccal wall. So by that, I lose a lot of uh, substance, a lot of volume. And here, finally, to finalize this introduction to the problem, I present this uh, uh, clinical study that translates to me as a clinician what I have just described to you in histological sections. Now, I see a group of patients in which in one side of the maxilla, a tooth was removed, while in the contralateral side of the maxilla, the corresponding tooth remained in the mouth. So you can see here in front of you, uh, a CBCT scan at Lichu. In one side of the maxilla of this particular patient, I have the alveolar process, while in the contralateral side, after one year of healing, I have the alveolar reach, the process and the reach. And with that, I describe, not I, Monica Misawa, Jon Lind and myself, we describe what happens to the alveolar process. And let me quickly show this table that because this really translates to us clinicians what's going on. First, the two lines represents what happens at the basal bone. Now you can see the second column is alveolar process. The third column is the alveolar ridge, in other words, after the healing. And the fourth column is the reduction in percentage. Now you see the first two lines, what happens the basal line, very few changes. The basal line, the basal bone, sorry, the basal bone is not significantly reduced by the tooth extraction. However, the alveolar process and becomes an alveolar ridge, there is a reduction of 34%. The height, and those are single extractions, 16%. The base, the base, when I say the base of the alveolar process, is the limit between the base, the most apical portion of the ovular process, okay? There's a reduction of 14%. Now the thickness of the ovular process from the buccal to the palatal bone walls, a reduction of 62%, three millimeters below the cement and nemo junction, and five millimeters below the cement and junction, we have a reduction of 46%, in average 50%. And this reduction has been demonstrated in different papers. So this is a lot of reduction, right, guys? A lot. And, but let's take a look here. And let me uh, call your attention to this red arrow. The red arrow is pointed at this number. The area, cross-section area, falling tooth extraction without doing nothing, only tooth extraction. 65 in average, 65 square millimeters of bone. Of course, 65 square millimeter of bone, you cannot place an implant, let's say 10 millimeter long, four millimeter wide. There must be a need for bone augmentation. And that's the truth. If you just extract two teeth in the anterior region of the mouth and wait for, wait for a conventional healing, very likely after one year, you will need bone argumentation, right? Now, let's look to this green arrow, point at the average dimension of the alveolar process before tooth extraction, about 100 square millimeters. Well, 100 square millimeters is more than enough bone to place an implant. So it shows that uh, two things. One, that if you do nothing, it's very likely that you need bone augmentation. Two, that if you are able to preserve not 100% of the 
of the dimension. But let's say 85%, 80%, you still are able to place an implant with enough bone at the buccal, palatal, and uh, interprosmal areas. With that in mind, I tell you the following, that everybody we perform, to, not everybody, I hope not everybody we, every day we perform tooth extraction. But definitely when we perform tooth extraction, we should have the knowledge that there will be a re reduction and maybe it will be very interesting to plan ahead what we are going to do. And perhaps we should compensate or prevent a larger ridge reduction. And now I will stop my sharing. Okay. And go back to oh. <laughs> what a long introduction. I mean, uh, but I see the enthusiasm you have for this, meet, for this topic. But I think when I, when I try to ask you a, a couple of key messages to reiterate the problem, I think you wanted to show us that in the anterior maxilla, that uh, the, the, the phenotype of the buccal bone wall is most often thin. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's also my experience. So you are dealing with a lot of thin phenotypes, and therefore you would have to expect a lot of bone resorption due to bundle bone resorption. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And right. the problem is the problem more on the palatal or more on the buccal? Well, definitely more at the buccal area because at the of course the osteoclast doesn't know what's buccal and what's palatal. Yeah. However, of course, the osteoclast activity in the very thin buccal wall have yeah. a very large clinical effect. I mean, the outcome is more evident. Now, buccal. when you do when you see a, a case, huh? and I think I always say as a clinician you have to make an extraction. And before you do the extraction, probably you should know what kind of phenotype you're dealing with. Huh? That means, is there a buccal wall? Is there no buccal wall? Is it thick or is it thin? You, know, you have three treatment options. You go for an immediate placement, option one. You go for an extraction um, uh, and uh, spontaneous healing or you go for extraction and you do socket grafting. These are the three options you have. Is that correct for you? Absolutely, absolutely. And I How do you do the extraction? I mean, do you do, uh, what is your current technique for extraction? Is it open flap or flapless? No, I can show, I brought one slide about the, my most common technique, how to extract a tooth, I can show, but, in my daily life, when I'm going to extract teeth in the maxilla from second premolar to second premolar, or even molars, and this is statically important, I always ask for a CBCT scan, so I yes. can plan. Because if I don't know the anatomy, what can I say? No, I mean, my... I see many, many papers, and this is I don't know if you have the same feeling I have, Danny. It's so difficult because people apply a lot of techniques, but we don't know about the defect. Yes, was the, exactly. Uh, was very large, was very thin, was very short, was very long. We have no idea. So it's, it's a very, very, very important message. You see, today, with all the different treatment options you have, you need to know before you do the extraction, what are you dealing with? Huh? And I, I would say, if you want to use all the options, including immediate placement, then you need a comb beam CT to learn about that because you cannot estimate that from a two-dimensional radiograph or from a clinical observation or a clinical examination. So you do a lot of CBCTs. I do before. Okay. I think it's, even, yeah, it, it's very fundamental. If I had to choose to do before mm -hmm. tooth extraction or later, I prefer to do before tooth extraction. Yes, me too. Because I know, yes, yes. And uh, there is only one exception. If you have a tooth to be extracted and you have on the buccal aspect an eight or 10 millimeter probing depth, you know there is no buccal plate anyhow. And then of course, yeah. uh, then you don't have to do any, a comb beam, you take the tooth off and then you do it afterwards. 
But um, mm -hmm. yes, now today, now the, your topic today, in the first Corona talk with Stephen Chen, we talked about this first option. When can we do immediate placement? Now you will cover today the third option. Uh, so that means the socket grafting. Now to stop or to let's say to slow down the rich alterations, uh, to lose the volume. And I think we should continue now with this uh, socket grafting for rich preservation discussion, because it's a very important discussion. I, I tell you, frankly, I'm using more and more uh, socket grafting uh, cases, uh, in particular in elderly patients. When patients are, uh, let's say, 75 plus, when I try to minimize the morbidity for the patient uh, with my surgical techniques, then I love to use soccer grafting today. And I'm looking forward now to your second portion of your presentation. Okay, let's go. Thank you. Now I go back here. So uh, my friends, as Professor Booth was saying, uh, yeah, I get the arrow. Now I'm going to describe how I should it should be done. And uh, as I agree, Dr. Booth agrees, I mean, it's uh, very confusing in the literature. But let's see, let's tell you how I do and my how I think when I plan for reach preservation. Now here I have four different sockets. We can see that every day I have a molar uh, three roots. I have uh, a premolar with two roots, and then I have a, a K9 here. Fine. What should I do? I have two options. I can decide for reach preservation. And please pay attention to my definition. That definition was published in a paper uh, that I wrote with um, uh, Massim Simeon, Christoph Hamlet. First, the first author is Hamlet, or maybe it's Hamlet Araujo, I don't recall, 2014. And the definition of bridge preservation is the following. It's something that I do to preserve the volume, bone volume that the patient have at the time of tooth extraction. So I need CBCT, uh, CBTC scans to decide if this volume is enough for me. Without the CBCT, how can I decide? Now let's imagine that I have to extract this particular tooth that you can see on your screen. Fine. Oh, I like this volume. This is more than enough. I feel safe. I feel safe. So let's just preserve this. Fine. That's fine. That's ridge preservation. Now ridge augmentation. Now I see the dimension and I decide that I need something else. I need, I need to increase for whatever reason. Usually is either because I don't have primary stability or I don't have bone enough to achieve a nice and predict, predictable aesthetics. Fine, but you have to decide. You need a CBCT scan. Now I extract this guy and I decide, or oh, listen, this is a the thin buckle wall. Well, you take a decision. Now let's see some examples that are very didactic for me. It's very didactic. I have four patients. The one to the, I have the patient to, to my, uh, the number one, two, three, and four. Obviously those patients that I never preserve the reach with or without immediate implant installation, because I, I might decide to place an implant and preserve the region or not. But that is number two and number four. How should I preserve this? This is, even if I have primary stability, I'm gonna have a aesthetic disaster. Now, patients one and three, they looks fine. If I'm able to preserve this dimension, I can, I should preserve the ridge. Okay, I can do something else. There is an option. But ideally, why not to preserve this bridge? It's perfect. Now, let's, I will show you now in this movie how I do daily in my clinic. Nowadays, because of, of the softwares of planning, I always use at, at the static portion of the mouth, the static zone of the maxilla, I always plane in this software. 
So you can see two patients, one to your left and one to your right. Let's imagine that I'm going to extract the central molar, no, sorry, the central incisor. And you tell me which one I should preserve, I can preserve, and which one I have to uh, do in two stages necessarily. Of course, the patient to my left, oh my God, there is no space for implant. At least I want to see, let's suppose that I'm going to do reach preservation. I claim that my implant, my future implant that I'm going to place nowadays at the static zone, I always place fully guided my implant. They will have at least two millimeters of bone at the buccal aspect. Now, of course, the patient to the left, this is not the case. So don't do rich preservation in these cases. Don't do it. You are going to fail. You are going to be frustrated. Now, very nice. Now, the patient to your right, of course, there's a nice dimension. Uh, another detail, never try rich preservation. If you have a soft tissue deficiency, like those I show you on your screen. Don't do it, you are going to fail. Now, there are many ways to preserve a reach. And in the literature, for me, maybe it's because I deal with that so deeply. I know a little bit about this topic. It's very confusing because there are so many people preserving so many different ways. And then you do a systematic review of different techniques that the, Sometimes the author even doesn't uh, describe the type of alveolar process he's preserved. So it's confusing. I advise you to use uh, osteoconductivity to preserve the ridge. Although I know there are not the techniques, but I strongly advise you to do osteoconductivity. I don't have time to explain why, but let's just tell you the following. The concept is to have a permanent scaffold. Imagine the implant. Implant is a permanent scaffold for the root, right? I don't want the implant to be uh, replaced by bone or replaced by dentin. I want the, the, the implant to be made of titanium or zirconium and stay there forever, hopefully. So uh, this is the same. I want a stable framework that will support the host bone of my patient, going nowhere. I want something that is osteoclast resistant. The osteoclast cannot model, cannot change the shape. That is the idea, to use a bony graft that's not only osteoconductive, that's great. Osteoconductivity, great concept. But the beauty is to be biocompatible, osteoconductive and to be permanent, to be there, like the titanium, fine. And that you should preserve, of course, nobody's going to place an immediate implant without trying to preserve the reach, right? You, I guess everybody who does immediate implant installation want to preserve the outline of the tissues, otherwise you may run in a very unpredictable scenarios. Fine. So. As I told you, this concept is, uh, uh, I don't have time to explain in detail, but this is it. This is something uh, that will give you stability. Because if I try to use autogenous bone, I cannot be very predictable when it goes to socket healing. And that I have shown in some preclinical studies in which one side of the man by place autogenous bone chips, as you can see on your screen, while the contralateral side, I placed a, an organic bovine bone. In my, my papers, at least, I use bioas or bioas granules or bioas collagen. And then in this particular paper, wait for uh, six months, one and a half year in humans. And you can see to your left, where I placed the autogenous bones, I cannot predict how the osteoclast or how much the osteoclast will model. The, the, the graft, while to my left or to my right, you can see a scaffold, a permanent scaffold to the uh, host bone of my patient. 
and there are several details here. And at the end, I'm able to preserve better the, the sites in which I place the biomaterials and the autologous bone chips, the gold standard of the graft in this particular type of defect is a four or three wall bone defect fail to, pre, pre, uh, to help to prevent reach reduction. So that's the concept. First concept, which graft you should use? One that stays biocompatible, bioconductor, osteoconductor. How to preserve the buccal wall? I told you to have a four wall bone defect is very important because it gives, provides stability to the wound. Even if I place the graft, if my graft is moving because the granules are in contact with the buccal soft wall, bone will not form. If the bioas granule is moving, there will be no bone formation. Everything should be stable. Now, if I am able to leave the buccal wall, the buccal wall will act as a resorbable barrier. I know the buccal wall eventually will disappear, but it stays there like a resorbable barrier, a resorbable membrane that after some time resorbs, but when it resorbs, the granules of my graft is already stabilized by the woven bone. Very good. Now, how do I do that? How I prevent uh, any fractures of the buccal wall? Usually, there are several ways to extract a tooth in a minimal way. But what I do, I take a burr, I divide the root in two pieces, a nisu and a distal. I take an elevator, I fracture the root. Then, after I fracture, I identify each half is more mobile. The fracture is always, it's very rare that the fracture goes up to the apex. Usually it breaks before the apex. So there is one half that's more mobile than the other half. So I identify this half. I take a peritone, I put between the uh, root surface and the inner aspect of the socket and I start to move my peritone for two minutes. Why two minutes? Two minutes, the time it takes for stretching the collagen fibers of the peritonto ligament. So for two minutes, I move my peritone in buccal and palatal direction. And, if I, and after this two minutes, very likely I have widened the space. And now I can take a very fine root elevator. I place between the root surface and the inner aspect of the alveolar socket, and I move my root elevator in a rotational movement, and I easily remove this first half. Then the remaining half, I will do the same. Obviously, now it will be easier because after I remove this first half, I open a space in which I can push this root remnant into that direction. And by that, I remove the entire root without breaking the buccal wall. My friends, listen, I know there are several techniques, but this is daily technique. That's the most useful, the simplest, the cheapest, and I think you are going to enjoy this. Of course, if you can extract without breaking the, the roots, that's fine. Now, uh, how much time should, this is very important. How long should you wait before you go back to the reach? If you're doing reach preservation, central incisors, four to five millimeters, depending on the size, laterals, four months, canines, five months, premolars, four months, molars, six months, okay? And now another question, another, uh, something else. Sometimes I listen to people saying, oh, when I reopen the site, I see that some granules are uh, surrounded by connected tissue. Well, two things may happen. First, you overfilled the socket and your uh, granules are above the crests. So you are surrounded by connected tissue. So it threw it away. 
or if these granules are inside the socket, it's still granulation, sorry, provisional connective tissue or woven bone. By the way, you cannot identify woven bone clinically because it's very soft. So it's because you have reopened too early. However, this is clinically without any importance because the, the, these areas that will heal for last are exactly the, in the middle of the socket. Very likely is where you're going to perform osteotomy. In any way, these granules surrounded by connective tissue, either gingival connective tissue because you overfilled or not, are going to be removed by your osteotomy. So actually, clinically, it has no problem. There is no reason to be discussing about that. Now let's continue. Now, this is a very didactic place, very didactic. I'm going to remove this and I'm going to preserve this ridge because I believe this dimension is beautiful to be preserved. Fine, in here I can see that I was able to remove this minimally, uh, in, in a way, minimally invasive without dividing the root in two pieces. As I said, from K9 to K9, I always divide in premolars. Sometimes I'm able to remove like that. Very fine. After removal, you take a correct and clean thoroughly, thoroughly. Why? Because if you leave a pathology at the apex, that may impair the healing of your implant you're gonna see that you may lose your implant afterwards because you left the pathology there. Fine. Now, about, I, you can see that I'm placing uh, the, the graft, but usually I don't place the graft like that. I do use a, a, a cotton plier, yes, because I, use, I like to use um, bioscology. So you should take it for cotton plier, but the best is you take a, uh, a piece of bios collagen, you cut into small pieces, and each piece you take a cotton plier, it placed deep inside your socket, piece by piece. It's very simple. And then you can put some pressure, okay? Don't be afraid to place some pressure into uh, your uh, uh, graft. Very fine. How to close your uh, how to close your socket entrance. By the way, I place my graft a little bit above the bone crest. I know that is above the bone crest, maybe will be some uh, connected tissue around my most coronally positioned granules. That's not clinically important. Now, how to close? I close many times with connected tissues. But I have to tell you, honestly, I do like that because I'm a periodontist, but there is no reason to remove a piece of gingiva from the palate of your patient only for closing the socket entrance. The socket entrance should be closed for only for 15 days. That's enough, okay? So if you close with a, a soft tissue substitute, if you close with your pontic, if you close with anything you want, that's nice for 15 days, because for 15 days, the granules may leave. After 15 days, these granules are surrounded by, by a provisional connective tissue, and it's, they are going nowhere. It's different when I use a membrane at the buccal aspect. Then you need a membrane for many months. So the socket entrance should be closed for 15 days. So don't be so over worried about that. There are even clinicians that leave it open. I don't, but I know many clinicians do that. Now, I, I'm just showing an example of a soft tissue substitute. This is called mucograft seal. So again, you can close with different things rather than connected tissue. This is after four months, and you have this beautiful buckle wall, very thick, beautiful. This is a very didactic case. However, let's move forward because sometimes you want to preserve at the, uh, at the static zone from K9 to K9. 
Here you can see a particular case in, in which I'm removing the tooth, placing the bios, and it's interesting here that the tooth removal, you can see that the, that the papilla at the mesial aspect was severed. Fine, you can place a suture. Now you place your uh, uh, an organic bovine bone. I'm going to close the socket entrance with a soft tissue graft. That's fine, fine. Now you can use a, 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 a provisional, a removable provisional, like a flipper or a fixed provisional, you decide. And here I reopen, and this is very important, I'm going to tell you. This thickness of ridge is more than enough to place an implant. I mean, I don't have a problem of bone here, right? It's very thick. I have a lot of bone, that, that's okay. My problem is this shallow concavity that sometimes, depending on the case, you may judge that may impair a perfect aesthetics. You may judge, it's up to you, to your case, right? And this in particular situation, I thought this was the case, so we can place a connected tissue or uh, a, there is a very interesting uh, soft tissue substitute now that is called fibroguide that has interesting outcome, very good outcome. So we can use this. And here you can see the sutures, and this is after one month, and the final outcome uh, is very nice. So it's very common that in stat demand situations, you want, you need to use a soft tissue substitute. Oh, sorry, a soft tissue substitute or a soft tissue graft. Now, uh, there is a third situation, third clinical situation that's very important in daily life. What about when you don't have a buckle wall? When you don't have a buckle wall, you have to replace the buckle wall with a soft uh, a collagen barrier, collagen barrier. And when I use a collagen barrier, I don't raise a flap. However, if you don't feel that you are experienced enough to place a barrier without raising a flap, okay, you raise a flap, that's fine. But if you're not raising a flap, let me explain how I do. Here I extract the tooth. I identify that is a buccal loss. I, I have many movies about that to tell you the truth, but I don't have time to explain in detail. But imagine the following. You take a tunneling instrument. I use the tunneling instrument from Hufridi, that the brand I use for this particular procedure. You place the tunneling instrument between the outer surface of bone and the periosteum, and you start to, to open a tunnel that has to be two millimeters beyond the buccal dehiscence. And then you place your collagen barrier, okay? After you do that three, four times, it becomes easier and easier, okay? After you place the collagen barrier, then you place the graft. Right? And of course, because I have a surplus of a, a, a barrier, collagen barrier, I can fold. I, when I fold, I close the socket entrance. And then the, the end, the palatal end of the collagen barrier, I put under the palatal flap. And then I just close with a cross suture. I'm not closing anything, by the way. I'm just to stabilize the buccal flap with this cross suture. And I use, this is a bioguide membrane. I know there are several uh, uh, brands. I don't know all of them, so I, can, I can't say about them. But uh, I, this particular membrane, you can leave it exposed. This is not a problem. I don't know about the other membranes, okay? Now, this is after four months, you can see this beautiful buccal wall, and you can see the bio walls surrounded by, um, by the whole bone of the patient. Now, now we move to other situations. However, maybe I give a break, so uh, uh, then you could make questions, maybe some 
clinical detail that I would be interested for the viewers. Yes, thank you very much. Now I put back my, my camera and uh, I think uh, you showed very detailed how you do today the socket grafting. I love that you did not say uh, the socket preservation technique because there are still colleagues uh, using that term, which is completely wrong because we don't want to maintain the socket. We want to maintain I'm the reach. Not. So that's very important uh, terminology. But now what you said, I think is very important. You see, you do that primarily when you have an intact buckle bone wall. That means the socket has an intact buckle wall. That's the main indication for your socket grafting application. No, but when I have a <coughs> donation of nine millimeters, I also do reach preservation. However, I do, let's, I, paid, I place my membrane to compensate yes. for yeah. the lack of the back row, as I have just described. That's the technique also. Dennis Tarnow often referred to the cone, uh, the cone, ice cone technique, I think, that he showed that also in 2005 in Munich, I remember very well, you see. Now, I think another point that needs to be discussed here as well, we know from immediate implant placement, we make a differentiation of thick wall and thin wall phenotypes. Now, I think we have completely overlooked that when we do socket grafting and we do that in thick wall phenotypes and thin wall phenotypes, we might see a, a difference in how much volume you can maintain. So I would expect that in thick wall phenotypes, the maintenance will be almost 100%. Whereas in thin wall phenotypes, because the, the resorption is so quick that you're going to lose about 10, 15, 20%. Then you have even to tell you something that uh, surprises me, because you can only see an effect of reach preservation if you do lose the buckle wall. Okay. Because when the buckle wall is very thick, the socket, you're gonna not going to benefit okay. what's happening to the socket because bone will form anyhow. You only benefit of the graft of the socket if eventually the buckle wall will disappear. And then the, this bone that was, this graft will stop the modeling because the osteoclast cannot remove biowalls. Okay. This is the point, but it's also true that you have a very, if you do have a very thick buckle wall, it, it disappears too early. The granules will be surrounded by blood clot or a granulation tissue or provisional connective tissue doesn't give you stability. So you start to move. And many colleagues then say, oh, did not work. Why did not work? Because the buck holds appear too early. It was too okay. thin. Yeah. So when you paper thin, paper thin, place a membrane, even if the buck wall is intact. Otherwise, okay. you may be frustrated. Okay, but you, when you get a buckle flattening a little bit, you see, and you also have an ability then to use a, a narrow diameter implant. So you don't need that much thickness on the buckle. That's what I do many times in premolar sites, uh, premolars, because then actually I compensate for a little flattening. And when this is not an aesthetic site, then I have no problems with that because the, so the treatment will be successful anyhow. Yes, I, I like uh, narrow diameter implants, yes. I tell you now, in our group, we use about 25% narrow diameter implants for many, many years. In particular, in premolars, the NNC of strom and a tissue level implant was 3.3 millimeter, which is a very strong, it's of course made of this uh, titanium zirconium alloy as a rock solid, because then you don't run the risk of fractures. So that's a, that's a nice option to use in socket graft cases where you get a little bit of buckle flattening a little bit. Eh? Now we got a question actually from our friend George Gebron from, uh, from Lebanon. Eh? We got a question on Facebook and he says, uh, Maurizio, don't you think that non-integrated biomaterials after socket grafting, healing period of four to six months will be a potential uh, etiology for peri-implantitis. 
No, there is no uh, support that in the literature. It's very interesting that uh, it's very appealing to think that a site previously augmented by a graft, I'm, I'm saying by was just because I use, but there are many brands, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there are many brands that I don't know them. That particular site will be more prone for a peri but um, okay. there is no support in the literature. I cannot say that no. sites previously grafted by BioWars are weaker. Yeah. No, I, I, I have the same opinion. It's not a weakness because you have to understand, you go back in, you prepare an implant bed. First of all, then when there is loose material, you take it off. And by the preparation of that implant bed, you stimulate again the formation of bone because this is a surgical trauma and this will initiate again the formation of bone. So I think that's why you don't see at the interface of that implant a direct contact between a biomaterial and the implant surface. It is always newly formed bone. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Exactly the same. You're going to see one. Actually, there is one histological section sh showing that it's a little piece of bios in contact with the implant surface. That is mm. the only histological section in the world. Mm. And it goes from WhatsApp to the WhatsApp, the same histological section. Because as okay. you said, it never occurs. Okay. Now, of course, you see the I, mean, uh, I use soccer crafting as well. But that might be about 10, 20 percent when I see a benefit for the patient. I don't like to use this approach in certain cases in the aesthetic zone because I have to wait too many months before we can go ahead and place the implant. So then I do, of course, often an early placement approach with four, six or eight weeks when I know I have to augment the bone anyhow to do a contour augmentation for an excellent aesthetic outcome. And I think that's to, to put that into perspective. That's one of the options we said. The immediate one is the third one, early placement, the second one, and then of course the soccer crafting and late placement. And now these are the three options we have as a clinician. Now in the third section of our, of our talk here, uh, you're gonna present some data and also future perspectives are you still working in that field or so i give you another 50 minutes uh, not too long yeah. because we have already more than one hour and i'm looking forward now to see what you tell us in that field uh, the third portion of your lecture i have to say something can i add to your comment yes of course and it's very nice to have uh, uh, three options yes of course it's very nice. I mean, it's not like black and white. It's I tell not. you that my residents, uh, maybe most of my residents nowadays are females. Yeah. And the lucky man. Believe, <laughs> <I don't laughs> believe, most, most of the dentists in the futures will be females. Maybe they are already most of them females. And they have uh, another, uh, a less, always a less, always a less aggressive way to approach. Yeah. Always, yeah. honestly, this is true in my opinion. And they really favor, for instance, ridge preservation. And uh, even if I can tell you, why don't you do this or this? No, well, I mean, I favor that. It works that's because well. they are students of Professor Maurizio. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> they are brainwashed maybe, by you, I maybe. guess. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> listen. Okay, let's move, let's continue. Let's move on, yes, very good. Now, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the uh, three different situations now. Actually, I'd like to talk about four, but I don't have time. The first one is when I want to uh, prevent Neumatization of the sinus. As we know, well, the socket is within the sinus or very close to it, in contact with falling tooth extraction. We can see in the x ray that the sinus looks like larger. And this is called neumatization. Very fine. So, because of that, sometimes when you reopen the site to place an implant, you may need 
sinus lifting. And that may add some more morbidity or uh, more cost to your treatment. So if you are able to prevent it, that's fine. So that's what I'd like to address. I'm gonna show you two cases, and then I'm gonna make a comment of uh, a particular study that I'm just finishing the writing that I, I am, I'm collaborate with uh, Dr. Ismail Kuri from the New York University. Now you can see a case in which I'm going to extract this premolar. Here you can see the extraction after four months. I can, I, I think you can see in this x-rays in the middle of your screen, how come the graft was able to uh, preserve the outline of the apical third of the socket that was within inside the sinus. And after four months, I reopened, as you can see here, and you place your implant, that's fine. But now you can see here eight years uh, later. Eight years later, this case might have more than 10, I don't remember, but I took the CBCT scan eight years later. You can see the outline of the previous socket. So it was able to preserve this outline for many, many, many years. So it's true that the graft with this particular graft that I have just mentioned to you can preserve for many years. By the way, my longest follow-up for a, a ridge preservation procedure has 23 years. It was with Bywas Granules, it was my secretary. And I have following her for many years and it stays. It stays, uh, hopefully it, we stay as long my implant stays in the mouth of the patient. Now it's another situation. Again, you can see the, um, the apex, the apical third of the smaller root inside the sinus. And I want to preserve this dimension to avoid do signs lifting, here's the tooth extraction. And when I do ridge preservation in a molar, I have to tell you some details. Now, first of all, we have to try to extract without breaking the buckle wall. So please divide the roots, take one by one. I know, I know it takes time because it's much easier to take a forceps and break the buckle wall and remove the molars, but don't do it. Of course, if you do it by mistake, you can also use a membrane to compensate for that. But ideally, don't do it. Another second point, be careful that because you have three roots, you might oversee a pathology in one of these roots, okay? And, uh, and finally, after placing the, the, the biowas, and I always use biowas granules, or you can use BIOS collagen 250 milligrams. That's my advice. Or BIOS granules 0.5 grams. Now you have to use here a membrane or a bone a soft tissue substitute. Please don't use connected tissue. Why? Because the connected tissue, when it's used to close the socket entrance, it's, it, it takes the nutrition from the adjacent periodontal ligament and the gingival margins. And because this is very large, this is very large, when you use a soft tissue graft, right, you may go under necrosis. Of course, if there is necrosis of the soft tissue graft that you place at the top to close the socket entry, that's not a disaster. It's not a disaster. After 15 days, you just remove this necrotic tissue and threw it away. However, this is not ideal. As I told you, the entrance of the socket only have to be closed for 15 days. After that, there is no more need. Now, so I use always this. I use this uh, barrier or a uh, mucograft. And here you can see how I close, very simple. Here's after six months, you can see the healing. And of course, I have a very large reach in which I can place my, my, my implant, there's no difficulty. And here you can see the outline of the previous sockets. You can see this darker, sorry, this uh, more, uh, this what's called bone that was the previous 
previous lamna dura of my uh, root. Now, as I, uh, let me go back here. Now, as I told you, uh, right now we are finishing the writing of, of the best paper about rich preservation in molars. This is a RCT performed at the New York University uh, with uh, Ismael Kuri, that I'm able to be work with him. It was beautifully performed, very well done, beautiful statistics in which in one side of the maxilla, uh, ridge preservation was performed in the contralateral side, no ridge preservation was performed and the patient would follow for six months. And you can see beautifully the benefit of read preservation for preventing sinus lifting. So uh, hopefully you see this year the entire paper published. Now another topic that I'm starting to work now is, is about uh, uh, fully edentless patients. When you go for extraction of all teeth, and uh, everything started uh, when I started to, to follow Jama's Galuch approach for, uh, for constructing full arch bridges supported by implants. And later with uh, one of his uh, students that was also my student, Andre, Andre Souza, who just happened to be my nephew, uh, that is following Jamas Galut footsteps and my footsteps. And so it's an interesting combination, why? Because what Jamas proposes is that you extract all teeth, you do reach preservation all the teeth to, uh, in all extraction sockets, and then you reopen and you place your implants in the previously preserved ribs. So this is the technique, reach preservation and late implant placement. I don't have to that time to show the research on that, that was produced for German. And this is great results, but he always focus on the prosthetic part of this procedure. And I want now to describe to you, and we are doing that right now with uh, Andre and Gemma, the, uh, the, the outcome of rich preservation in this fully, fully uh, uh, extractions, uh, or, uh, uh, full arch bridges in this, previously augmented ribs, or not augmented, preserved ribs. So you can see a case from Andre in which he's going to extract some teeth. He, he placed, uh, he preserved the ridge of the sockets while in the remaining teeth, he placed a provisional prosthesis. After six months, he reopened, placed the implants, in the previously preserved reeds, previously preserved reeds, hmm? waited six months, right? While he waited, not six months, sorry, six weeks. Uh, during the six weeks, he placed the provisional restorations in the remaining teeth. And after six weeks, he removed the teeth and placed the provisional restorations in the now newly also integrated implants. And this he has been showing, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What have I done? Sorry for that, sorry for that. And he has been showing, uh, and, and German as well, how beautiful reach preservation uh, performs in these full extractions. It's beautiful, really beautiful. In another case, now uh, Andre extracted all teeth, did reach preservation all sockets, and after six months, he reopened, placed the implants, and the outcome, I think, I think you have read that in the publications by Gemma Galuch. It's wonderful, the outcome. And I tell you, I can tell you that in terms of bone volume, the outcome is also beautiful. And that's what we are going to describe to you in the coming, uh, in this year, 2021. Finally, 
The final topic, oh, by the way, by the way, I just forgot to tell you, there are a lot of systematic reviews about the breach preservation. And honestly saying, sometimes I find that very confusing. So many different techniques and uh, different of uh, the process, uh, oh, confusing. Nevertheless, all then we tell you that breach preservation reduces the pause extraction mode loss, that breach preservation re decreases the need for further treatment depending of the paper, because if you choose the wrong socket to preserve or the wrong alveolar process, I mean, you're gonna fail. And then all reach preservation techniques and there are many are effective in reducing reach preservation. Fine, but the final topic I'd like to, to address is how I see reach preservation. And I see the following that reach preservation is not only for late implant placement. Reach preservation is also for immediately implant placement because when I do immediate implant placement, I choose carefully my alveolar process and basal bone. I choose, perf I choose perfectly as well I choose for reach preservation. The same care I take for choosing the right site for reach preservation, I use for use the right side for immediate implant installation. Otherwise, I go for early. So, but that's also true that when I do reach preservation for late implant placement, I have the entire socket to graft, but now I have only one gap. And part of this gap has a, a vascular surface that that's the implant. And there is a ma many differences here. And uh, uh, I have done, performed, I have already finished to perform this paper, all the studies there. We are just writing the paper. The first one has been already finished, the writing and submitted, but I have three or four more. And in which I study, from my point of view, because I'm looking at biology, I'm looking at bone and, and, uh, and dimensions, the effect of the same technique I do for reach preservation using at a gap. And here you can see one of these particular studies that I like very much in which I'm going to graft a gap that occurs after immediate implant installation and see the outcome of this graft by comparing to the health contralateral center incisors. I'm comparing to the health contralateral center incisors. So this experimental surgery procedures the following, minimally of extraction, implant placement, socket graft, okay? While uh, when we place the graft, in, everybody received a connected tissue graft. So everybody has a connected tissue graft. This is a static zone. In the static zone, I always advise you to use a connected tissue graft. This is my advice to you. While, uh, but when we place the implant, some patients had a gap that was two millimeters, more than two millimeters, and some patients a gap that was two millimeters or less. So I, I divided the patients according to the dimension of the gap. Okay, here you can see uh, the procedure, it's nothing special. Tooth extraction, uh, place the implant according to the manufacturer in the perfect three dimensional position, etc. Place the connected tissue and then my connect, my craft. Uh, and as I said, some patient has a wide gap, some patient has a narrow gap. And after uh, uh, two months, the prosthesis start to be performed, to be constructed and was placed. And here you can see some of the cases. Very fine. But what I want to see is the, the, the tissues. Now this is the outline. This is the tooth site, pristine tooth site, and this is the implant site. I'm going to compare and I'm going to see how much I can preserve. I know how I can preserve when I graft the socket without the implant. What about with the implant inside? Now, this you can see my two groups, sites in which my gap was very wide. Here to your left, see, and to your uh, right, 
the narrow gap, two millimeters or less. And you can see the outcome. Uh, you can see the, out, the CBCT scan of this corresponding uh, pristine contralateral in center incisors. Very fine. Let's study, let's translate these images into numbers. Let's look at the bone. Now, this is a comparison between the width, width of the ovular process and implant reach. As you can see, when I have a wide cap, I have a reduction that I describe in percentage that is much less when I have a narrow gap. So a narrow gap, when I place an implant, it produces a very poor result in terms of reach preservation. Now let's move forward and now I see the height of the buccal wall. You see the height of the buccal wall in the pristine, corresponding pristine in center size is the same. But when I place the implant, when the, in the wide, in the wide gap, I have a, 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 a buccal wall that the height is the same as the height of the buccal wall before tooth extraction. However, when I have a narrow wall, I lose half of the height of the buccal wall. So again, a narrow gap doesn't work so well, reach preservation or gap, or oh, it's a reach preservation. I mean, I'm trying to preserve the dimension. Now, what about the thickness of the buccal? Right. Both groups has at the pristine size, the same thickness of the buccal wall. It's in this particular patient was about 0.8, very fine. But after implant installation, when I have the wide gap, two millimeters or more, the th after six years of the implant, I have in average two millimeter a thick buccal wall, while when I have a narrow gap was about half millimeter. Mm. Again, another feature. You see, I'm talking about different features, anatomical features. Now, another, another something that's very important. What about the location of the root outside the bone envelope or inside the bone envelope? Does it, the, is this an important feature? Yes, it is. Oh, sorry, I was too quick. Now, the worst, the best situation if you are going, if you decide to do immediate implant installation, if you have chosen a good, a good ovular process, the best situation is when the ovular process is inside the bone envelope, right? Inside the bone envelope. And you place also, not only that, I have, there's a, many, well, is inside the bone envelope. And the, and the worst situation is when you have a narrow, narrow gap and your bone and your ovular process is outside, outside the bone envelope. You see, it's a difference from 6% of reduction to, to 63% of reduction. So at the end, at the end, all this, not only the dimension of the gap, so all these anatomical features are very important for the outcome of reed preservation. Being this reed preservation being performed uh, uh, for immediate implant installation or for late implant installation, I mean, the dimension of the ovular process is very important. And some details that you have to pay attention, how thick it is, how thick is the buccal wall, the thinner the buccal wall, more critical will be to use a membrane. Otherwise, don't do it because it's too thin. Or, and also the dimension of the basal bone and several things. So the morphology of the ovular process and the gap in case you favor immediate implant installation is fundamental for reach preservation. Thank you. So those are the three topics in read preservation that I'm currently writing about, about. Hello. Yes, yes, of course. I'm listening very carefully. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, Maurizio, thank you so much for these excellent insights into this uh, interesting topic. I mean, uh, we have to keep in mind, as I mentioned, uh, this was all, in, it was all in, introduced by this uh, first landmark paper in 2005. <clears throat> I did not mention that, but this paper uh, in, the part, in the last 10 years has gotten per year 100 citations plus. Uh, has more than 1,000 citations today. I mean, that's absolutely stunning. And it shows the impact this paper had huh, in our way of thinking. And that's what you said. You need to understand the tissue biology of the alveolar process. Uh, what happens to the bone and then the, also to the soft tissues. So I really love that paper. And of course, how, how much influence it had on our way of thinking, on our decision-making. Can be very proud. Sure. Thank you, thank you. No, I also own you who could interpret this. And I oh. remember that I, I believe you were the first one to talk about this in the International Congress. Of course, Yon Linde was the first and then you. Yes, yes, so I, I tell you frankly what, <laughs> I heard the first time about this in 2004. It was an ITI annual meeting, and I was sitting in the back with my buddy, Er Spelser, and Jan presented early results. It was not published, and said, I did this study with my, with my young friend, Maritza Russo from Brazil, and he showed this, and it was like an eye-opener for me, because I understood immediately this explains the different outcomes you see in patients post extraction. And that triggered the whole thing. So I think when I, when I, when I summarize what you said, you need to understand the, bio, uh, the, uh, understand the biology, we said that already, but you also must know the morphology and the anatomy of the alveolar process at the area where the tooth will be extracted. And you should know that before you do the extraction. That means the extraction is the first step of your treatment. And then the treatment plan is already established. That means you cannot pull the tooth and then make a decision, what should I do now? I think that's very important. That's different what we did 20 years ago. That's correct. Then you degranulate the socket to eliminate pathology. And then you do the soccer grafting with a low substitution fill. I think we both are using the same bios collagen. I love to use bios collagen. I actually stuff it in. Do you also stuff it in with an instrument or so? So it's not too loose? Yes, me too. And there is no problem. People get worried about that. Oh, there will be no growth of vessel. My no, God. come on, forget it. They have, no, they have no understanding how small a vessel is, you see. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I use? I use a depth gauge of the, of, the, of the implant system because that fits into an alveolus beautifully, a 3.5 millimeter depth gauge. That's how I stuff it in. Huh? And then you said it's actually, you use either uh, a soft tissue graft or you can use a muco graft or something else. I lose, to be very honest, I use a piece of collagen plug because that's only about 10 bucks because uh, we have to be careful not to, over, to overuse the biomaterials and then the treatments get more and more and more expensive for our patients. So a collagen plug, so a little piece, put it on top, and then a cross leakage of what you showed works beautifully. So it is a protection in the first 10 days and then the healing yeah. progress is nicely. Very nice results, so. Absolutely. Okay, now my friend, huh? I know now I have to go to bed now because it's here, uh, it is already uh, uh, 10.40 p.m. and uh, you go and have supper with your wife and your, uh, with your son. Uh, how is actually the, the, the weather in, in Rio de Janeiro right now? Very warm, I can tell so you. It's summer, huh? I see that, yes. And how is the pandemic situation? Oof, I don't Oof. know what to say. <laughs> At least in Rio, I read on the news that's going down. But, okay. But uh, always a new wave coming. Do you, know, do you know what is here? What is here? 
Huh? What is this? No. It's my Did shoulder. I got today the vaccine. <laughs> yes. Oh yes, I got the vaccination because I'm in an age category where you get uh, where you have an easier access and I'm a healthcare provider. So two days ago, I got an, e an email from the university. Now they're going to start to also vaccinate the, the university, university hospital people. So I should make an appointment. And this morning I went there and got a, an, a, an a Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, absolutely painless. And now I get another one in four weeks, and then I'm on the safe side. I'm going to get mine next week. Okay, you're a young kid, my goodness, yes. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful insight into your favorite topic, I know. You deserve a heck of credit for this. Uh, and I look forward that we can meet again in, in, uh, in of course, in physically i don't know when we have the next meeting where we can attend uh, we just have to be careful to stay on the safe side and this uh, crazy pandemic will disappear in the next i hope six to 12 months and then we start again to see each other so uh, give my best regards to your family uh, and uh, looking forward thanks again it was fantastic thank you thank you it was a pleasure. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.